Assalamu alaikum to dear viewers and mourners of Aba Abdullah Al Hussein. We are here with a very special episode from Toronto with our special guest this evening, Maulana Sayyid Ali Raza Rizvi. Sayyid is a renowned scholar who travels around the globe giving lectures about the Ahlul Bayt. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidina. Sayyidina, we are soon approaching Arba'een, insha'Allah, which is our topic of discussion this evening. So, can you give us a little bit of clarity on when Arba'een actually happened? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, when we use the word Arba'een, which is the 40th in Arabic, it has a lot of importance and significance based on the traditions of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. And... Uh, the word 40 itself has many different stages, 40 days, 40 weeks, 40 months, 40 years. All of them have uh, its own significance. And for 40 days, if a person concentrates and becomes sincere, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the doors of wisdom from his heart or her heart to their tongue. Uh, this is the tradition of the Holy Prophet. Man akhlasa lillahi arba'ina sabahan. So the word 40 itself has a lot of significance. Hazrat Musa salam, went for 40 nights um, and that was a miqat of Hazrat Musa. And likewise, the Holy Prophet at the age of 40 um, announced that he is a messenger. And hence, we also have the um, human evolution <coughs> where a human child remains in the womb of the mother for 40 weeks, which is nine months. So likewise, so the 40th itself is the completion of many things. Just as Ghadir is the completion of religion of the Holy Prophet, likewise uh, the Arba'een or the 40th of Imam Hussain al-Islam is the completion of Ashura. The message of Imam Hussain al-Islam completes uh, at Arba'een. And Ashura is incomplete without Arba'een. So Ashura, the, the Shahadat of Imam Muhammad Islam is, um, has gone through an evolution where Hazrat Zainab al-Kubra and Imam al-Sajjad both went as captives from Karbala to Kufa and then to Halab and then from Aleppo to, to Damascus. Uh, and then they returned on the 40th of Imam Muhammad Islam to uh, Karbala. So from Ashura to Arba'een is extremely important. Um, and hence, we all still try and visit Sayyid, Sayyid al-Shuhada on the 40th because the first Zahirin of Imam Muslim al-Islam came to Arba'een, uh, came to Karbala on Arba'een itself. Um, and many of our great scholars or of our mystics have emphasized that even if only once in a lifetime, <coughs> do visit Imam Muslim al-Islam on the 40th. Because that is the completion and that is one of the signs of a mu'min, a believer. There is a hadith by Imam Hassan Asqari where he says that Alamatul mu'min khamsun, there are five signs of a believer. Salatul ahidah wa khamsin, ziyaratul arba'een, doing 51 rakats and also visiting Sayyidul Shuhada or at least deciding his ziyarat on the 40th. So more than Ashura, the 40th of Imam Muslim Islam is very important to visit Imam Muslim Islam. Uh, and what about the difference of opinions that scholars sometimes hold, you know? Um, can you throw some light on the difference of opinion scholars have, the clashes in opinions regarding when Arba'een actually happened? If you look at the difference of opinion, there are many great scholars who believe it happened. The 40th of Imam Muslim Islam was the first year. It was the 61 Hijra. 61 Hijra Ashura Imam Muslim Islam Shahadat and then the 40th the same year on, Ash on Arba'een the Ahlul Bayt al-Muslim returned to, uh, to Karbala. Uh, but m most of the scholars believe it wasn't the first year. It was 62 Hijra. It was the following year. They both have their own reasoning. Most of the scholars who do not believe it happened the first year, um, they say historically uh, the time was not uh, long enough for them to, to go to um, Damascus and then return. Now, um, even scholars like Sayyid Ali Qadi Tabatabai, Ali Aga Qadi Tabatabai, who is one of the greatest mystics, he believes that it, it happened the first year. Many of the great scholars or of our believe that it happened the first year they returned. And many great scholars, historians especially, believe that no, it did not happen the first year they returned. Now, the difference is that they say that the Ahlul Bayt reached 
Damascus on the 1st of Safar. And 20th of Safar is the Arba'een. So for them to have reached uh, Syria, Damascus on the 1st of Safar and for everything to happen and for them to return back to Arba'een the first year, historically it is not possible. But on the other side, many of the scholars say that all of those Masaib happened within the two weeks and it was too much for them to handle the Ahlul Bayt Muslim, and they must have returned the first year. So it was too much for them and Hazrat Sakina or Ruqayya bint al-Hussain uh, passed away the first week. And so all of these Masai, but many of our scholars have mentioned that it did not, it cannot happen uh, in the first year. So there are uh, all of these differences of opinion that was it the first Arba'een 61 Hijrah or was it the uh, Arba'een the following year in 62 Hijrah that they returned to, to, to Karbala. And um, as we all know, it was Sayyid Zainab who first went to the grave of Aba Abdullah al Hussein um, to commemorate Arba'een as to say. Um, why, why do you think it's important to imitate her steps? Well, there can be many reasons, but I will just quickly briefly touch upon a few. Um, if you look at Hazrat Hajra or uh, Hagar in English as they call her, the mother of Hazrat Ismail, the wife of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, when she gave birth to Hazrat Ismail, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Hazrat Ibrahim to take them to, uh, to Mecca and leave them there. So Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Bewadin ghayr di dharin, you know in the Holy Quran says, in a valley that has no plantation, no water, Allah, it is your order, hence I submit. But I do not understand how they will survive yeah, with, with no plantation and no water. So he, he was uh, so much in grief leaving his wife and a newborn child behind. Uh, because he was quite elderly. So he left because of order of Allah. Hazrat Hajra, to save his life, she was running between Safa and Marwa, and Hazrat Ismail touched with his feet the ground, and then the water of Zamzam started. And Hazrat Hajra's footsteps are still being followed. We still go to Hajj or Umrah and we uh, walk between Safa and Marwa because to save the life of uh, a uh, a prophet or an infallible, Hazrat Hajra walked between Safa and Marwa. And all of her steps are being followed. Allah has made it a uh, 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 compulsion, compulsion in religion to follow the footsteps of Hazrat Hajra. And hence, we believe that a greater sacrifice was being made in Karbala based on the verses of the Holy Quran from Surah Safat. We have replaced it with a greater sacrifice. So, it was Imam Hussain who made the greater sacrifice and Hazrat Zainab Kubra took all of those steps to save the message of Imam Hussain So hence we believe that we need to follow the footsteps of Hazrat Zainab Kubra to show our love, compassion and reverence for Imam Hussain And that was in the shape of Hazrat Zainab Kubra and we imitate every step that she took and the way she tried to walk from uh, a long distance to, to Karbala. And when it comes to the sacrifice of Imam Hussein himself, we take of it, we think of it as something very grand and unique. It definitely was unique, but like, how can someone like me and you try to translate that sacrifice into our lives? Or can we translate that sacrifice into our lives? Because whenever we think of Whenever we think of the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, we say that, oh, it was the Imam who did that. And only someone like an Imam has the capability of doing that. There's no doubt about that, but because of that reason, people don't even try sometimes. So, how can we try? How, how is that possible? We have to try in our own capacity. Allah Matabatabai says what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Imam Hussain Islam, even the many of the prophets, most of the prophets did not ever accomplish and achieve what Imam Hussain Islam achieved in Karbala. What he achieved is something unachievable. But if you never ever set a high goal for yourself, you will never improve. So in Ziyarat Ashura we read, Allahumma ja'al mahya ya mahya Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa mamati mamata Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Oh Allah, give me the life that the 
Ali Muhammad, the progeny of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived, give me that life and give me the death that they had. Allah Ta'ala says that you cannot even, even the prophets didn't have the life or the death that they had in Karbala. So how, why are we asking for something so great? Number one, when we set a very high goal, then it makes us move in a similar way. That because it's a high goal, you know, the aim is so high, then we'll have to work hard. Even though we know that we'll not be able to accomplish, but we'll work hard to improve from where we are to get as close as possible to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We will never be able to achieve it. Number two, to place that as our aim and our goal is uh, not that we'll achieve, but to show our love for Imam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we are st still following the footsteps. Because after Karbala, after Ashura, there are only three practices that people will have. You either have to follow the footsteps of Imam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi to give everything that you have, to sacrifice everything in the way of religion. Or you follow the footsteps of Imam Sajjad and Hazrat Zainab Kubra um, that you spread that message. Or the third is the practice of Yazid. So to stay away from the practice of Yazid, you have to try and follow one of the two. So that you are on the right path. You are on the path of Imam Hussain to try and sacrifice, to try and give up, or to try and preach to try and deliver to other people what Imam Hussain al-Islam tried to do for religion. And that's what we try and do when commemorating on Arba'een that we are on the footsteps of Imam Hussain al-Islam. We are at least following Imam Hussain. We'll not be able to accomplish, we'll not be able to reach his level and we know that. But at least we are still on the footsteps of Imam Hussain al-Islam. We are on the line of Imam Hussain al-Islam. So when you say we have to try, right? For different age groups, trying can mean a lot of different things, right? For example, a person like me, I would be, let's say, if I'm a student, right? My struggle would be something like going to university, writing my exams, passing them all with good grades, and inshallah, finding a good job. So different age groups have different struggles. And how would you connect that with the struggle of Imam Hussein? And what, how, how do you define trying for different age groups? Can you elaborate a little bit for each age group? Um, first of all, as young um, adults and especially children, Imam Hassan Mustafa has a very beautiful saying where he's saying that, Oh my children, not just to his own children, but to his children and his nephews and nieces when he's dying, when he's uh, been poisoned and he's going through the Shahadat. He says, listen to my words very carefully. Try and memorize my words, what I'm saying to you. Memorize this will. And if you cannot memorize it, then write it down so you don't ever forget what I'm saying to you. Because today you're children, but tomorrow you'll be leaders. And in your own household, at least, you'll be leading. So try and memorize everything I say. So every person in their own capacity has to try and learn so they can tomorrow lead. Now, as children, they learn, and as young adults, you also learn, and you try and accomplish, you try and achieve, because the more you learn, the higher your recognition, the better you'll be able to practice, the better you'll be able to deliver, the better you'll be able to lead. The society also always needs leaders. What has made us very stagnant is when we want to all just find jobs, and that makes us servants and not leaders. And in a Muslim society, every individual has to have the ability to lead and become just and become knowledgeable, become learned and become a leader tomorrow. And then amongst the leaders, the best leader will, will lead. The person who has the best capability, the best ability to lead. Um, but it does not mean that the others do not have the capability of leading. Mm -hmm. They all should have the capability of leading. We believe that if all messengers of Allah were in one uh, city, there will be no difference of opinion amongst them because all of them have the same goal in life and that goal is God, that goal is Allah. And hence we believe that um, every individual should try and become a leader. Even if they do not lead, 
but they have the capability. So every individual. Now, one of the other downsides is that many a times people who, when they are young, when they are students, when they are, they keep improving and moving forward. But there comes an age where they become stagnant and say, I do not wish to improve anymore, I, or I'm no longer on that journey. That should never happen because, you know, many of the scholars say that never be pleased with yourself, never be satisfied. That's it, I'm now very good. I don't need to improve anymore. The room for improvement is always open. And you should always never ever be ha happy with yourself that I'm done now. I don't need to improve anymore. So all your life, throughout your life, even in old age, you should be improving and getting closer and closer to God and to the hujja and to, you know. Uh, so this is the, the real goal in life. And there are materialistic things that we can achieve in this life, but there should be spiritual efforts that we have to try and make to improve. And one of the teachers in Umar al used to say that um, many du'as we ask are all materialistic or worldly du'as. But what about some of like Munajate, Shabani or you know the du'a Rajabiya, which is everything about the hereafter, about the paradise. About why even in the paradise do we think about the Hurul Ain and the palaces and the food? What about that spiritual journey in the hereafter, the evolution, God himself, the Holy Prophet, the Imams and the learning process, because even the paradise will not be stagnant. There will always be takamul, there will be an evolution happening there. Evolution, I'm talking about not the, I'm not talking about the scientific evolution, I'm talking about the spiritual evolution. Um, so there will always be improvement and that's what we because no one can completely comprehend God. So there will always be improvement in our comprehension and our understanding. Uh, and that's what needs to accomplish. Santam, Santam. And uh, the next thing to note about trying is that the Imams themselves, they, they led their lives as an example to leave a legacy, sort of, to, for us individuals to learn from them. Um, when we talk about Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he used to work in the farm, he used to do that not because he had to, because he wanted to do it for himself in order for us to learn and take lessons from that. So when it comes to the whole movement of Imam al Hussein, Abu Abdullah al Hussein, when it comes to Arba'in, when it comes to Ashur, how can we take lessons from individuals involved in Karbala? So let's start with Hazrat Qasim, for example. How did he teach the youth? What lessons did he have for the youth? Okay. Now, they all set an example. The Aymal al-Muslam set an example for us. So becoming role models and the setting example was the biggest accomplishment. Now, each and every individual in Karbala set an example for the oncoming generations. Hazrat Qasim al -Islam, even being young, and so full of life, you, you all want to live as young individuals. No one wants to die young. No one wants to die at the age of 20, 18, 19, and he's only 13 and a half. So at a 13 year of age, he says to Imam Hussain Islam, um, Uncle, am I one of the shahada of Karbala? Am I going to be taken as a shaheed? So Imam Hussain Islam, Kefal Motu Aindak, how do you see death? What is death in your view? So he says, Ahla min al asal, you know, uh, more sweet than the honey. And this is a sign that he is, uh, you know, still a child because children love sweets. So he says, you know, it is sweeter than the honey. So Yom Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, um, not only you, but even Ali Asghar will become a shaykh. Look at the, the love he has for death that even elderly people do not have that they want to die. But because the death is for a purpose, is for the righteousness, is for the justice, is for God, is for the Imam of his time, he is willing to sacrifice even being so young and he feels that it is better than anything that he may achieve because he understands that the sacrifice is for a greater cause, for a bigger good. And that's what he teaches. 
that even being so young, if you have a greater good, you can give everything you have. And the next on our list is Hazrat Abbas. What did he teach us? Hazrat Abbas salam, has many aspects to his life. He's the greatest uh, shaheed after Imam Hussain. And if you go to Karbala, all shahada are in one place. But Hazrat Abbas salam, has his own haram. Um, because he's the greatest shaheed after Imam Hussain in Karbala. So the Imams have given him a separate haram, his own haram. Hazrat Abbas salam, how did he get his own haram? Being the bravest, being the strongest, being the greatest warrior after the Imam salam, in his time. When Imam tells him, go and uh, tell them, ask them to give us one more day. Don't fight today on the 9th. Give us one more night. We want to spend in worshipping God. Imam Hussain could have asked anyone, but he asked Hazrat Abbas. It was the most difficult for Hazrat Abbas salam, to go and speak to the people who've come to fight him or to kill him, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the greatest jihad. When you go against your, your will, your desires, he had come to ask Imam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, can I go and fight them because they've attacked us? Imam Muhammad says, no, don't fight them. Go and ask them for one more night. Now, when he, basically, Imam Muhammad is giving them more time so they can think and horror can come and other things can happen, so he's giving them time by saying, give us more time. And he asks Hazrat Abbas to go and ask for that time. It was most difficult for Hazrat Abbas to go and ask for the time, but he still did it. He went against his desires for the Imam of his time. He is uh, the most faithful to Imam Hussain And he showed his faithfulness. When he went, Shemir was related to his mother from far. So he says straight away that I have brought you Aman Nama, I will, that you are as peace, you, you can come over if you want. He said, I wouldn't even talk to you had it not been for my brother and my Imam who's ordered me to speak to you and say that stop the, war, the battle for, for at least a night. Do not give me any protection. I do not want any protection, protection from you. I have my master, my Imam, my Mawla, Hussein ibn Ali. That faithfulness, you know, at the time of death or at the time when you know that this battle is a uh, suffer, you know, in worldview, it is a lost battle. We'll all die. It will finish. Everyone would want protection and life. But Hazrat Abbas says, I will give everything I have to show that Imam is worth and the hereafter is worth more than anything else. Sayyid, now the reason why I used um, Hazrat Qasim and Hazrat Abbas is because both of them they faced a lot of disappointment during their stay in Karbala. Hazrat Qasim faced disappointment by not being able to go out and fight, not being regarded as one of the shaheed when he asked Imam al Hussein if I'm going to be shaheed as well. Um, and Hazrat Abbas, on the other hand, not having permission to fight, which in itself is one of the biggest disappointments because, as they say, that he could have wiped the entire army by himself. Um, while Thinking of these disappointments, we often tend to neglect the disappointment of Hazrat Hur, Hazrat Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi, who inflicted so much harm on the camp of Imam al Hussein by stopping water. So, tell us a little bit about his disappointment. Elaborate a little bit about what he might have been going through at that time. Hur on the second of uh, Muharram uh, had stopped Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was, he first came, he was thirsty of with a um, group of a thousand soldiers. So Imam Hussain had enough water for a thousand soldiers, but he said, give them. I do not wish to have the water. But this is, you see the message of Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you have something, give it up if someone needs it more than you. So he sacrificed all the water. Um, and then when Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Hur that it is time for prayer, I think it was the whole time. So he said, go and pray with your people. He said, how can I lead the prayers separately in your presence, O Hussein? So Imam Hussain Islam understood that this ha he has the ability to, to follow. So when Imam Hussain led the prayers, they all prayed behind him. But when he was about to leave, who came and stopped Imam Hussain? He said, I have, I'm not going to let you go. I came to arrest you. I cannot allow you to go to Kufa. So Imam Hussain Islam said something to him, may your mother 
a brief you, meaning may you die. Now Hur thought a little and he wanted to repeat that sentence to Imam Hussein. And he said, oh Hussein, if anyone said this to me in Iraq, I would repeat the same words. But I can't say it to you because your mother is Fatima. Alayha. Many scholars say that Imam Hussein only said it to him, not as a swear word, but to remind him whose son is Hussein or who is Hussein is Hussein's mother. And that's what made him think. And when he reflected upon this fact that Imam Hussein is the is a son of Fatima and the grandson of the Holy Prophet, he kept thinking and thinking until when Shabay Ashur, when the ninth of Muharram Hussain said, okay, one more night. When the sixth Imam was asked, Mawla, how can tafakkur uh, saatan afdala min ibadat sabi'ina sana? Or sabi'ina alf sana, for example. There are traditions that thinking for an hour can be better than 70 years of worship or 70,000 years of worship. He said, how? He said, like that of Hur. He thought for an hour and he converted himself from being uh, a, an inhabitant of the hell to become an inhabitant of the paradise. He converted from the hell to paradise just with one hour thinking. He said, no, I'm not going to remain in hell. I'm going to go to paradise. He quickly converted and said, okay, I'm going over. And that's thinking of an hour when you think deeply you can change your life, the positive energy you pick up and change your entire life. He changed his entire life with a few moments of thinking. That's the lesson from Hur. His repentance, his love, his sacrifice and his thinking, his reflection. Another interesting thing about sacrifice in itself is that Imam Hussein himself could have done so much during the battle. He could have flipped the tides and he could have had the battle in his favor. So when he chose not to do that, when he chose not to have water, even though he could have had water through miracles, etc., etc. So what does that teach as individuals to have power, to have the capability of doing something, but choosing not to do it? What does that teach us? There are many lessons, but the first lesson to me is the submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That above everything is the will of Allah. Oh Allah, if you, because you see, he himself says that when he was leaving Medina, he went to the grave of his grandfather, the Holy Prophet, and he, he cried so much that he fainted uh, you know, on the grave and he embraced the grave. And he says that I saw that when I have um, dropped on the grave of my grandfather, he, woke, he got up and he embraced me and he said, uh, um, Ya Hussein, inna Allah shaa an yaraka qatila. It is the mashiyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is irada and there is mashiyat. Um, the divine intent and the divine will. Irada is less than mashiyat. In, in Allah Shah and Yaraka Qatila, the Mashiyat of Allah, the divine will is to see you as a martyr, as a shaheed. Not just the intent of Allah, but the divine will, because the sacrifice of all prophets is going to end if you do not sacrifice. And he said, What about my sisters? He said, The Mashiyat of Allah, the divine will, is that they and become captives and they, they save your message, otherwise your message will die if they do not sacrifice. So, the first thing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did was submit to the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. No matter what happens, I will submit and I'll be strong to sacrifice everything. Second thing was that he never showed any uh, weakness. He was strong. The enemies say that as the day was passing by, the glory on Imam Hussain's face was becoming greater and greater. He wasn't becoming weaker and weaker by the day. He was becoming greater by the day. As the day was passing by, he would be stronger. There was no weakness in Imam Hussain. The majesty, the, the jalal on his face was greater um, in the time of Asr than at the time of Fajr. Even though the hunger and thirst is increasing, but his greatness is increasing. He's becoming stronger. 
So the trial wasn't making, making him weak, it was making him stronger because he was succeeding in his trial, in the tribulations and trials that he was going through. He was becoming stronger. So that's the second message. The third message <coughs> from Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, that even after going through all those trials, there is no complaint. He says, Oh Allah, your servant is before you. Ridhan bi wa tasliman li amrih. Ridhan bi wa taslim. You know, I am truly pleased with whatever you have destined for me. I'm not angry. I have no displeasure. Wa tasliman li amrih. And I have totally submitted myself to whatever you have willed for me. I will not complain. And the fourth message, I can continue many messages, but the fourth message would be that even after all of those sacrifices, you learn to live through death. Yazid lived, but he died even though he was alive. And Imam Muslim taught us to live even after death. Death cannot kill you if your aim is high. If your aim is God, then even after death you will live. And many people are just living deads, you know, living dead bodies. Yazid was a living dead, and Hussein is a, you know, he's a, a being that lives even through shahadat, even through, even after death he lives. And many people are just dead walking about. So he taught a lesson that you can live. Don't worry about death. Don't be frightened of death. You will even live through death. And that's one of the greatest lessons he, he taught. Another very important thing to note about Imam al Hussein during his stay in Karbala is that he sought refuge only in Allah. Even when he was lonely, even when everyone had left him in the battlefield, one after the other, everyone went and became Shaheed. He was left alone, but he still sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we as individuals, when we are faced with loneliness, we tend to turn towards other people, people like us, for example. We tend to share our problems with them, which is normal, but sometimes it gets too extreme where we forget that Allah even exists. So what, what sort of a remedy would you offer to individuals, like, how does one get rid of loneliness like this? You know, the Holy Quran says that the early Muslims, you know, when they converted, they became isolated. So the God says, do not feel isolated. Tell them, my messenger, that angels come down upon them and they are surrounded by angels. Um, because they're isolated, they feel that we're isolated from human beings. Well, what about the angels that are around you? Now, Sayyid al-Shuhada taught a lesson that you know, many people always claim that I will fight till the last drop of blood in my body. But they never fulfilled. I will fight till the last soldier, till the last arrow that I have. They had the weapons, they had the soldiers and they gave up. Imam Hussain said it and he performed it till the last soldier, till the last arrow, till the last drop of blood in his body. He stood up against evil. He stood up against falsehood. He stood up against injustice, against oppression. He stood up and he fought till the last drop of blood in his body. And he, he proved it, that it can be done. And after lifting the bodies of all the shahada, he stood so strong. And hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, said, Ya ayyatah nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbika raziyata mardiyya, fadkhuli fi ibadi, fadkhuli jannati. In the first words of the verse, you feel that an angel is calling back. But in the last verse, you understand that it is God directly speaking. This is Quran. You know, ya ayyatah nafsul mutma'inna, O tranquil, you know, satisfied soul, irji'i ila rabbika raziyata mardiyya, return to thy Lord, in the state that you are pleased with him and he is pleased with you. This could be an angel speaking so far. Come and become a part of my ibad, my servants. 
and enter my paradise. Now we know that it is not an angel speaking, it is God himself speaking. Even though you're so isolated that you have no one now, but you are so high that God is saying that you are in my company. I am calling you back myself. And that's what Imam Hussain Islam lived. Inshallah, this brings us to the last question of this evening, which is how is Imam al Hujja so similar to Imam Hussein? So when we mention his name, we say that he is the Hussein of today. So what do we mean by that? First of all, Imam Hussein was left. He, he had the best companions. He said that uh, I have the best companions that even my grandfather, my father and my brother did not have. They would ask their companions to come back and they would not. And I'm telling them to leave and they would not. So Imam, Imam al-Hujjah al will have the best companions. He'll have the best 313. Better than any prophet, better than any imam. First of all. Secondly, he is still isolated. Just like Hussain was left after the companions were all martyred. Imam is, for 1100 years, he is by himself. He may have a company of the Khidr or, you know, one or two with him, but he is isolated. He is he's all alone. Third, Imam Hussain openly stood up against injustice and oppression. And Sahib al-Zaman al will do the same. He will openly declare that you're either on his side or you're against him. You're either with him or against him. There is no third option. You cannot be neutral. Just like in Karbala, you're either Husseini or you're Yazidi. You cannot be neutral. Likewise, you'll either be Imam Zamani or against him. So there's no third option. There is no, you cannot say that I'm neutral. Now, one of the things that Imam Zaman al Islam will do, he'll announce five times Allah ya ahl al alam or people of the world, or universe, people in this universe, or inhabitants of this universe. Inna jaddi al husayn qataluhu udwanan. Or sahakuhu, you know, five times he'll announce. And everyone will hear in their own language that it is my grandfather, Hussein, who they had killed um, with injustice. So he'll not introduce himself through anyone else but Imam Hussein and Islam because two reasons. One, that everyone will have heard about Imam Hussein and Karbala. And secondly, everyone will truly believe that yes, it was injustice that happened against Hussein. It was oppression that happened. But when everyone admits that he was oppressed, because there's no one more oppressed than Imam Hussein Islam, then he will say, okay, now that you admit that he was most oppressed, I am his successor. That's why he is the true son of Imam Hussein and he's a true Hussein of this time. When we say that we have, when everyone's going to be hearing about Karbala and everyone, every soul on this earth will know about what Karbala was, do we, as Shia, do we have a duty to go out there and tell people about Karbala when we ourselves have not understood Karbala fully? Even just that people, if, if they hear about Karbala, you know, it, it, Karbala is such a, um, even if you don't understand, just to introduce Karbala because it makes people move and read and try and understand. It is the only incident that moves people that, yes, there is no way anyone can defend Yazid. There is no way anyone can ever defend Yazid, but everyone will defend Imam Salah. Mm -hmm. Now, and hence we have Arba'in, and hence we have this great march, and, and the world will know, the entire world will know. And even if you go back 100 years, even 50 years, majority of the world did not know about Imam Hussain. Majority of the uh, you know, world did not even have majalis for Imam Hussain. But today, every single country in the world has majalis for Imam Hussain. Every single continent has majalis. Every big city in the world has remembrance for Imam Hussain Islam. This, within our lives in the past 50 years that has happened, was unthinkable even 100 years ago. And what will happen in the next 10 to 20, 30 years is unthinkable because every single person will know as Arba'een has become the most uh, focused event in the year. The largest non-political gatherings in the world are all in Karbala. And Arba'een is the largest gathering. Millions and millions of people are now attending. This will surely move the world and bring about a change 
and that will not be reversed. Lastly, um, when we talk about receiving letters from Imam al Hussein, Zuhair ibn Qayn, he received a letter from the Imam as well, and his wife offered to go by herself if he doesn't end up going. So, what is the sort of letter that we receive in modern modern day life? How, what is what are our letters from the Imam? There is a letter to everyone, and that is whenever Muharram comes every year, there is an invitation from Imam Zain Islam for everyone to think of the sacrifice. It's a reminder. It's something that no matter how much you may be busy in your life, you will still think about, attend and be a part of, even if you're not religious. Even people who are not religious and they do not attend mosque at this, you know, on a regular basis. But Muharram is a time when everyone moves. And that is the invitation letter from Imam Hussain. Whenever Muharram comes, they have an invitation. No one invites anyone. People ask when Muharram is coming. Because they know Imam Hussain al Islam is coming. It is not Muharram that is coming. It is Imam Hussain coming into our lives again. Becoming a part of our lives again. And it's a reminder of his sacrifice, a reminder of the tribulations he went through and the reminder that we are a part of his life. And we need to become true Husseinis. Alhamdulillah, that brings us to the end of the discussion for this evening. And we hope you all did benefit from this. I would now like to thank Sayyidna for joining us here this evening. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And we hope to bring you more programs like these in the future, insha'Allah. Iltamasi dua. Assalamu alaikum.